Hello, and welcome to the webinar today. My name is Carrie Berger, and I'm the Assistant Project Coordinator for the Northwest Fire Science Consortium. I'll be the moderator for today's session, and to avoid any noise interference, I have muted your audio. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat box. Also, I will be recording the webinar and will archive it on our website and YouTube channel. You can find those web addresses listed in the chat box. I've also added links to papers that our guests will be referencing today in their presentations, and those can also be found in the chat box. So we are very fortunate today to have two speakers, and while they, are, while they hardly need an introduction, I'll go ahead anyway. Paul Hesberg, a research a landscape ecologist with the USDA Forest Service, and Ryan Haugo, a senior forest ecologist with the Nature Conservancy. And they'll be talking with us today. So Paul will be starting off. So um, let's get you set up here, Paul. And then whenever you're ready, Paul, go ahead. All right, can everyone see that okay? I can see it okay, Paul. Okay. Good morning. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us. Our first talk this morning is going to um, summarize a recent uh, review article that we published in the December 2015 issue of Landscape Ecology. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors. And uh, I'd like to start this talk by suggesting that um, through this review, we've discovered that decades of stand management have not added up to highly functional landscapes. And that's sort of a punchline of this work. And as I go along, I want you to be able to notice how a variety of things that we've observed in our review uh, point to this in a strong way. We conclude at the end of this paper that prescriptions for local and regional landscapes are needed to remedy many of these effects. Today, we see many battlefield images of brave men and women fighting a common enemy, and the common enemy is wildfire. And wildfire is perceived as being a strong negative on a landscape that actually depends on wildfire. So an awful lot of what I'm gonna talk about this morning is actually a, a really different backstory about wildfire. I'm gonna start by briefly discussing historical fire regimes in the inland Pacific. And then I will uh, talk about how management alters the fire regimes. And by altering the regimes, it changes the structure and the composition and the landscape patterns of forests. And this leads to significant changes in how the landscape actually works. I'll also talk about how a warming climate is setting up a perfect storm. We, we've got dense multi-layered forests that are now drying and curing quite frequently and leading the way to really significant fire events. And finally, I'll close with some key principles that emerge from our study of these changes and their implications for management. We live, work, and play in a wildfire environment. Lightning ignited wildfires occur naturally and extremely often and it's unavoidable. Native Americans, they knew this and they burned the forest and ranges that they inhabited and they traveled through. They initially burned in the shoulder seasons because summer fires were pretty hot and dangerous, so they were proactive. They cultivated wild edible foods with fire and they increased forage for the ungulates that they hunted and for their large horse herds later on in their history. And this intentional burning went on for 10,000 years or more. And in fact, the burning was so significant on these landscapes that you can think of the pine forests and the dry and moist mixed conifer forests as being rather fuel limited rather than full of fuel. Native plants, animals, even fishes are adapted to fires. And in fact, they're adapted to the fire regime the frequency, severity, the seasonality, and the spatial extent, the patterns of patches of wildfire severity are even important to the species that have adapted. Pine has a thick bark that resists fires constantly lapping at their bases. Balsam root resprouts from a deep taproot. Pileated woodpeckers nest in snags. Lodgepole pines 
Logical pine cones aft open after fires. Cianeltis resprouts from surviving roots, and seeds that lie dormant in the soil are triggered to germinate after fire. Deer browse on fire-regenerated shrubs, and fires maintain them within a sufficient browse height. And landslides that occur after fires create diverse fish habitats. Indian burning ceased about 1850 when, sadly, the, the native tribes were marshaled onto Indian reservations, but early settlers continued much of that burning on into the early 1900s. In this particular slide, I'm showing um, approximate mapping of all of the fire starts that were associated with the epic 1910 fire year. And what you see in the left-hand map, basically the western U.S., west of the Great Plains, is wildfires essentially doing the good work of wildfires. But what we notice is that the uh, 1910 fire is mostly painted with what happened in North Idaho, Northwest Montana, and Northeastern Washington. And this is an area where early logging uh, by uh, Potlatch and Weyerhaeuser Corporation and some other uh, lesser corporations um, essentially uh, were moving through the western white pine forests uh, and the large stores of western white pine. And these were areas of high slash concentration. So, so these fires burned really big and really hot under fairly extreme weather conditions. But the setup was uh, logging and a tremendous amount of slash in these areas. After the 1910 burn, attitudes about burning the landscape uh, became more and more negative and fires were progressively suppressed. In the early decades of the 20th century, weren't, we weren't great at fire suppression, and so there was still a fairly significant area burned in the early 20th century. Between 1934 and 35, so fire, fire suppression began a period of quite high efficiency. This was the advent of the 10 a.m. rule. By 71, the rule was all fires out by 10 a.m. and keep them less than 10 acres. And you'll notice that fire suppression works pretty well for about five decades. And then in about 1985, we start to notice that suppression begins to fail to reduce the acres burned. And this has been powerfully linked in the literature to not only hotter and drier summers and increased fuel. Historical fire regimes fairly closely map to uh, climatic zones and land cover conditions. So areas of, of unique climate and life form tend to explain an awful lot of fire regime zonation. For example, if you look at the Mediterranean climate area of Southwest Oregon and California, you see a preponderance of fire regime group one dominated by low and mixed severity fires. If you go to the north, to the coast range, the Olympic Peninsula and the west slope of the Cascades, you see fire regime group five. This is an area of high precipitation and fires are quite infrequent and, and when they do occur, they tend to be pretty severe events. So you can see this coupling historically between land cover and climatic zonation. And this has been to some degree decoupled. In the next set of slides, I want to talk about, um, uh, sort of illustrate some of the uh, major fire regime differences and how they've changed between the historical and the current era in the inland Pacific. Low severity fires are those that typically kill less than 20% of the dominant tree cover by first order fire effects. And it's because fires occur really frequently, every five to 25 years, let's say. Flame lengths tend to be short because fuels are consumed really often. And so you see uh, flame lakes like occur in the upper right hand slide, resultant conditions like in the upper left. And in the picture below, this is a, a dry pine and dry mixed conifer area from the 1930s. This is in eastern Washington in the Methow drainage. You can see how fires maintained very open forest conditions and actually quite extensive grasslands in areas that were capable of supporting forests. If you look in the far right, you can see that low severity fire regimes really meant most of the fires tended to be low severity but 
as uh, climatic conditions were variable, you'd see also some mixed and high severity fires occurring. And so you got some variability in not only fire severity, but successional conditions that emerged. You can see how that barcode changes in the current condition. There's a lot more mixed severity fire occurring in these conditions right now and high and much less so low severity fire. In the mixed severity fire regime, we typically call at a patch scale mixed severity fire those areas where 20 to 70 percent of the tree cover is killed by fire. This was fairly common in the uh, dry and moist mixed conifer forests of the mid of the inland Pacific, where you see ponderosa pine, dug fir, grand and white fir, western larch occurring. These fires occurred with intermediate frequency, and so there was more fuel accumulation, but it often tended to be patchy. So you got patchy, gappy fire effects. You have mixed surface and crown fire effects, like you see in the upper right, leading to a patchiness uh, within patches, like you see in the upper left. The 1930s era uh, picture is close to my home here. This is a Liberty Beehive area, that, an area that was sculpted by mixed severity fires historically. And again, looking at the historical to current changes, you can see how mixed severity fire regimes also supported lesser amounts of low and mixed severity fire within these patches, but the dominant fire regime was mixed. And you can see in the current day, it's much more high severity and mixed severity fire in these historical mixed severity forests. The high severity fire regimes are the obvious ones where most of the tree cover is killed by fire. These are obviously common in the wet and cold forests where fires are quite infrequent. In the inland Pacific, this can be every 150 to 300 years. In some of the moister forests, they can be as infrequent as every five or 600 years. Most of the fires historically were high severity, but milder climatic conditions actually favored milder fires, which you can see in the upper right. And in the current era, it's mostly high severity fires and much less of the variability that we used to note in the low and mi in mixed severity fires in these zones. A couple of uh, feedback mechanisms I want to discuss um, occur at two different scales, and these are pretty important landscape ecology ideas. One feedback is a local feedback, where low and mixed severity fires thin uh, forest patches. They're constantly reducing density in fuels. And with thanks to Bob Van Pelt, I'll illustrate that through uh, a sequence of drawings that he's made available. So, so here's the cartoon. At time zero, you see this open canopy structure favoring medium and large size trees. You can see surface fuels and some fuel ladders developing within the first couple of decades. The fire comes through, lightning ignited. It's burning up surface fuels, the occasional fuel ladder. And so you see this again, more open structure where Carrying capacity is not realized, much less than full carrying capacity is realized. In the next couple of decades, you'll see a fire come through again, burning those surface fuels again, torching out um, some fuel ladders again, producing uh, this characteristic open patchy circumstance. And what we see with fire suppression is an epidemic of trees. Those trees that were thin and reduced, those fuel ladders that were sequentially eliminated now exist on the landscape and they're quite common. And so there's fairly high contagion, not only for accumulated surface fuels, but also there's high crown fire initiation and spread potential that emerges from that. So that local thinning mechanism that reinforced the self-reinforcing has left the system. There's also a regional feedback that was pretty important. Fires, the patchwork of fires and of successional conditions, this burned and recovering landscape, help to regulate future event size and severity. Let's take a look at that. So this is a landscape level positive feedback mechanism, and it's what we think was the natural resilience mechanism of large landscapes. This patchwork spatially interrupted conditions that supported large fires. So it actually influenced the frequency, size, and severity of future events. Insect disease and weather disturbances added to this complexity, but as we understand it, fires carried most of the water in these landscapes. Extreme weather events would occasionally override these spatial controls. That's the way it was historically, and we still understand that to be the case currently. 
In the next series of six slides, I want to show you what I think are some pretty breathtaking changes occurring in less than a century. The top photos are going to be black and white. These are, are part of the William Osborne collection. The bottom photos come from John Marshall Photography. We've done repeat photography in about 100 of these uh, lookouts, fire lookouts from the past. Here in this uh, location near Twist, Washington, I want to show you that a landscape in the upper view that was perfectly capable of producing a lot of forest is actually dominated by grasslands. So areas that are capable of producing pine and dry mixed conifer forest are actually stuck in an alternative stable state in grass or shrubland states. And we now know this to be actually quite common. And in, in the forests that occur on the north facing aspects, they're actually fairly thin and open for us. If you look at the same area in 2011, you can see that an awful lot of that grassland is filled in with dense forest, and you don't see the dominance by grassland, rather you see a dominance by forest now. These are in, in quite dry forest locations. In the next slide, this is in the Methow Dream. This is Leecher Mountain in the 1930s and uh, 2011. In the bottom view, again, you can see uh, a tremendous extent of grassland in areas that are capable of producing forests. So this frequent fire is actually making it difficult for pine to regenerate or pine douglas fir to regenerate and maintain forest cover. And then you can see in the areas where you do have forest cover, they're quite open. You see in the 2011 view of the same place that much of the grassland has been colonized by trees and most of the area colonized by trees is densely colonized. This area burns uh, very severely in the Carlton Complex 2014. This is closer to my home. This is looking out the uh, backside of Mission Peak, about 12 miles southwest of Wenatchee, Washington. Here I want to show you the strong correspondence of open, limited forest on south facing aspects and ridge tops. This is a pretty common occurrence in the dry forest locations. And so you can see in the upper view in 1934. An awful lot of the landscape is not heavily forested and not heavily fueled. In the 2010 view in the bottom, you can see that that's changed really significantly. An awful lot of that forest has been, or that, those open slopes have been colonized by rather dense forest. And you can also see, if you look carefully, there's significant bark beetle mortality and bugworm defoliation going on in those drier asphalts. This is a look down the Entiat drainage. From the top of the upper photograph, this is Duncan Hill looking uh, to the east towards the Columbia River main stem. And what I just want to show you here is in 1934 how much of this landscape was sculpted by fire. And you can see tremendous variation in patch sizes, grass, shrubland cover, a lot of shrub fields. Uh, tremendous variability in size, structure, density. And if you look at the lower view, it looks like a continuous carpet of forest. So an awful lot of the size, age, density is blended upward. And you see a rather contagious forest where you saw uh, a very, very patchy forest that was sculpted by much fire in the 1934 view. This is the Slate Peak area uh, near Mazama, Washington. This is an area of uh, cold forests primarily. And what I want you to see here in this view is there's, there's a tremendous burned area and it's very, very patchy, um, even in the subalpine forest. So even though we think of them in the individual patch of ground not being burned that frequently, over a large space and long time frames, there's actually still quite a bit of fire going on in those landscapes. And in the upper picture, I want you to notice that there's an awful lot of uh, avalanche shoots that are dumping into the valley bottom. And you see that uh, is rather absent in the bottom view, which is uh, 2013. Finally, the last uh, panoramic comparison, this is Bethel Ridge area. The big peak you see in the background is Mount Rainier. This area is east of Rainier, west of Natchez, Washington, north of Rimrock Lake. And this is an area of moist and cold forest. I'm sorry, moist mixed conifer and wet forest. And I want you to see again just how much fire is in this landscape in 1936, pretty close to the time when we inherited these forests. 
And uh, notice in the 2012 picture that, again, you have this contagious forest. We've got tremendous amount of mountain pine beetle in lodgepole pine and Douglas fir beetle in the Douglas fir occurring in this now dense forest. And you'll actually notice, if you see the patches of beetle mortality, they're occurring in areas that regenerated densely uh, after fires uh, in the 1936 image. All right, so big changes. Uh, an awful lot of areas that are filled in, uh, grass and shrubland areas filled in with trees, and then sort of this overall densification of the forest. All right, I want to finish by discussing uh, seven uh, principles that we uh, carried forward for, uh, from what we observed. This first slide here uh, is a look at the Blue Mountains province. And the principle is that broad regional landscapes are really landscapes nested within landscapes. Uh, you can see the Blue Mountains province in the lower right there. That's basically a map of life form patterns at the scale of a province. You can see green forest, gray shrublands, grasslands, and these patterns are corresponding with uh, areas where the environment and climate support the major life forms. But what we notice in the lower left is that changes in cover types within the forest life form actually have the ability to influence the patterns of life forms. And correspondingly, within at smaller scales, changes in the structure of the forest have the ability to change uh, patterns of structure and composition at larger scales. So at, at uh, province to patch scales, there are important patterns that exist, and there's a need to restore connectivity and processes at each of these levels. Second principle is that topography provides a natural template for restoring vegetation patterns. And the implication is that we can use topography to refit characteristic successional patterns back to the landscape again. On the right side, you can see a map of valley bottoms and ridge tops, north and south aspects. And we see a strong correspondence to the composition and structure of the forest with these topographic templates. Fire and forest succession are the engine that drives the system. That's principle three. You can see in the map here, I simply want you to notice in the historical and current rack of, of images here that structure in A and B, historical and current, corresponds closely with fuel loading, crown fire potential, and flame length. And the implication here is that if we restore supportive successional patterns, the disturbance regimes will follow. That's what we see from looking at the relationships between the variability in fire regimes and the associated successional patterns. Fourth principle is that predictable patch size distributions historically emerged from these linked climate, disturbance, topography, and vegetation interaction. And that restoring these size distributions of successional patches is important to adapting the fire regimes. Widely distributed medium and large sized trees and old trees provide a critical backbone for dry pine and dry and moist mixed conifer landscapes. Incredible genetic legacy and they have the ability to withstand fire and in a lot of the vagaries of climate. Retaining the existing old trees and old forests and making more of them, making more large snag and down logs of these types is important. Principle number six really comes from Andrew Larson and Derek Churchill's work and Jamie Lyerson's work. One of the things that we've learned is that within a lot of the dry and moist mixed conifer forest is that there are patchy gappy patterns of tree cover within these stands and, and these patterns are extremely important to fine scale habitats and to driving processes that patch, patch neighborhood and larger scales. So in the pine and mixed conifer forests, restoring this more characteristic tree, clump and gap variation is important to higher level functionality of these landscapes. Finally, the last principle is that land ownership allocation management and access patterns of disrupted landscape and ecosystem patterns. And there's really a need to work collaboratively across ownerships to develop restoration projects. There is a, if you stop and look at this, this map here, this is Eastern Washington, North Idaho, and a bit of Northwestern 
Montana, and any shade of green is forest. And you can see that there's just tremendous fragmentation by ownership. In all these ownerships, there's different management plans, different timing, sequence, objectives, and they don't match up. And so ownership patterns actually have a fairly strong influence on not only management going forward, but ecological processes too. So there's a need to collaborate and work together to pull off larger landscape prescriptions. In summary, I'd like to suggest that historical forests were highly spatially heterogeneous at several different scales. This was derived from interactions among succession, disturbance, and other processes. And the native flora and fauna were adapted to these variable and heterogeneous conditions. These conditions were resilient to the variability in climate and recurrent disturbances. We suggest that it's important then to restore key characteristics of this resilience. And planning, planning and management are needed at fine to broad scales to accomplish this. Restoration needs to work across ownerships and land allocation and will require active thinking about landscapes as social and ecological systems that not only provide services to people, but within the finite capacities of these ecological systems. And in this particular paper, we focus our attention on developing landscape level prescriptions as foundational to restoration planning. I'd like to acknowledge the photographs of John Marshall, Brian Salter for the maps that I showed you and research support from the organizations that are shown there. And uh, at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, so as Paul said, if you have any immediate questions right now that you want answered um, based on his presentation, otherwise we can move right into uh, Ryan Haugo's presentation and take uh, some questions at the end. So I'll just wait a minute or two to see if anybody has anything immediate. Otherwise, uh, we'll move on to Ryan. And thank you, Paul, for the really great presentation. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jay. Should I go ahead and mute my audio now? Yeah, why don't you do that? I don't see any questions coming in, so I, I think I'm just going to go ahead and pass it uh, to Ryan. All right. Okay, so next up is Ryan. And um, Ryan, you can go ahead when you're ready. Great. Thanks, Carrie. And thanks so much, Paul, for that out standing presentation. Just, Carrie, are you able to see my screen um, when I switch the presentations? I sure am. Great. Okay. So I'm going to try to take the baton now from where, where uh, Paul handed off and keep going. And um, so that, again, Paul provided a tremendous um, introduction and dive into these seven core principles for uh, restoring our fire-prone landscapes. And what I want to do with my presentation then is to take these seven principles um, and provide an example of how do we take these and how do we put them into action. So a real world application of putting these principles on the ground. Um, starting honestly from, from, from the uh, end in Paul's last discussion about land ownership patterns. So the the world that I I live in uh, and 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 do most of my work in the Eastern Cascades of Washington, as Paul mentioned, um, is is heavily fragmented um, by the patterns of land ownership of public and private lands. You know, adding on top of all of the you know the difficulties that we face because of wildfire suppression and pest management. We have the added complication of land management. You know, and you, you when you fly over these lands you can you can starkly see these these land boundaries. So it was about ten years ago or so that within um the East Cascades of South Central Washington, uh the the dominant landowners in this region, um, including the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest, the Yakima Nation, the Washington Department of Natural Resources, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Nature Conservancy uh, came together to form what you know what is now called the Deposh Sustainable Forest Collaborative. Um, uh, mentioned on this list, Paul and PNW Research Station 
uh, although not landowners, have, have, have been a, an integral part of our collaborative efforts as well over the last decade. And if we look at so the Taposh's uh, mission statement, it's very, very nice. Uh, um, improving ecosystem health and natural function through the use of best available science, community input, adaptive management. You know, nice, very warm fuzzies. Um, you, you feel good saying and thinking about these types of things. But, as every, you know, I think most of us on the call here are involved in land management in one way or another. And you probably realize that these things are much easier said than done. Um, you know, and honestly, the the challenges that we face in our you know, fire dependent forests coupled with the challenges of these mixed ownerships, it's it's a it's a lot to overcome. And so about a year, year and a half ago, the Taposh Collaborative um launched what we're calling the Banastashtanum Resilient Landscapes Project. And it's to take that mission statement of the Taposh Collaborative and the challenges of cross ownership uh work head on. So the Manastashtanum project it encompasses about eighty thousand acres of forested land across four sub-watersheds in the East Cascades. Uh, it's just directly south of Interstate 90, just over the pass from Snoqualmie, uh, right south of the towns of Clay Elm and Ellensburg. Uh, these watersheds range uh, from really the, the lower ecotone with shrub step almost up to the, the Cascade Crest. So we have a huge diversity of forest and habitat types within these watersheds. Um, and it's here that the that uh, that the Taposh Collaborative has decided we want to we want to take head on how do we apply these principles how do we restore resilient forests and streams and do that in a coordinated fashion and so central to our efforts to apply these principles um, are are again something that Paul mentioned it's it's working with local landscape evaluations taking each of those sub watersheds um, and conducting these local landscape evaluations. And then using that to, to to put into context our work. These local landscape evaluations are critical in that they set the context for what does whole landscape restoration mean and how do we coordinate treatments across ownerships. And they are critical, you know, for answering the question of what is it that each owner can do to contribute to whole landscape restoration. Obviously, the conditions and opportunities that the um, state agencies have are different than what the Forest Service has, are different than what the Nature Conservancy has um, within this landscape and within these landscapes. So uh, just a quick schematic. Um, from the get-go of the Manastash Tandem Project, we have discussed within our collaborative group that the terrestrial side, um, Restoration of terrestrial conditions and of aquatic conditions are equally important, and it's critical that the terrestrial and the aquatic sides move together um, in step with one another, and that there's good feedback. Um, but honestly, you know, I myself am a forest ecologist, so I'm going to focus today on the on the terrestrial side, and that's not to downweight the importance at all of the aquatic side. It's just the, it's just the expertise that I'm working from. So the project, the process that we're working with is that our first step has been to conduct um, these terrestrial and aquatic landscape evaluations for each of the four sub-watersheds. Um, we then move those into what we call landscape prescriptions on both the terrestrial and the aquatic side. And then by integrating those tr those landscape prescriptions together, we develop um, you know an integrated pipeline of projects um, to help restore ecological health and resilience on both the uh, terrestrial and the aquatic sides. So how do we do this? So on the terrestrial side, you know, we were very fortunate in that we were able to take the landscape evaluation process that has been developed uh, by the Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest and by the PNW Research Station, um, and we were able to apply that across our ownerships and across watersheds. And that's what I'm going to uh, work show, work through in the next couple of slides here. And so at the foundation for these terrestrial landscape evaluations is that we are certainly looking at the structure and composition of our vegetation. But then we go further than that. It's not sufficient simply to look at it for vegetation, but we also look at uh, habitat for some of our, you know, uh, endangered and our important wildlife species that we have within this landscape, including white-headed woodpeckers, goshawks, martins, uh, northern spotted owls. 
We also explicitly look at disturbance hazards and risks related to fire and insect and disease. And, and core to these evaluations is taking each of those vegetation, wildlife, and disturbance um, uh, attributes and comparing our current conditions today within each watershed to a set of reference conditions. Um, many of us are used to thinking and talking about HRV or historic range of variation. You know, that's the range of conditions that may have historically existed within these watersheds prior um, to wildfire suppression and 20th century management. Um, but also very exciting is that we don't stop at that historic look. We know that the climate is changing. Um, we know that um, our forests are going to experience warmer and drier conditions in the future, and that's going to have big implications for fire and insect and wildlife and hydrology and all sorts of factors. And so within our landscape evaluation process that we're using um, from the Okanagan Wenatchee strategy, we also compare our current conditions to what's called a future range of variation. This is not based on you know, a formal projection of, climate of, of a future climate, um, but it's, it's a rough approximation. In my mind, I think about it as um, if our historic landscapes had been able to, if they had had the opportunity to adapt to our currently changing climate in the absence of our 20th century management, um, what might they look at? What, what might they look like? And the foundation for this idea is that um, you know, climate change presents some big risks, but from the perspective of our native fauna and flora, um, you know, absent all of our monkeying around in the 20th century, these systems would likely be, you know, they would be in a much better condition to adapt to our changing climate. So in our, in our landscape evaluations, we're comparing current conditions to two references, historic range of variation and future range of variation. Both of those references are derived from the work of um, the Interior Columbia Basin Ecosystem Management Project, I think I got that right. Um, uh, back in the in the mid '90s, this was a massive project to uh, take a sampling of subwatersheds across the Interior Columbia Basin and photo interpret the earliest pot available aerial fo uh, photographs. Often those are from the 1930s or 1940s, and from those we just were able to develop an amazingly detailed record of of what those pre-management landscapes looked like. Um, obviously, by the 1930s, there had been management, um, but this process, you know, was, was, was able, was careful and was able to pick out those watersheds that had, you know, less influence or, or, or were able to, you know, exclude the evidence of logging and other impacts that were evident in the photos. Um, so each of these, uh, this landscape was then, um, split or classified by different biophysical settings. And then, the, you know, each of these sampled historic watersheds, uh, you know, stratified by their biophysical settings provides a reference to which we can compare our current landscapes today. So foundational for making these comparisons is the use of uh, photo interpretation from high resolution stereo imagery. That obviously was the basis for how the historic watersheds were evaluated. And it's also the basis for how we evaluate our watersheds today, our current conditions, um, using modern day uh, high resolution imagery uh, and interpreting those using the exact same protocols that were used to interpret the historic uh, watershed photos. I think this is an important point to make here is that when we get down to the evaluation of individual watersheds, at least you know what I've found is that some of our remotely sensed data, such as um, uh, GNN, hugely valuable when we're doing region-wide evaluations. But when it comes time to, to planning with an individual subwatersheds and trying to plan out individual you know project treatment areas, um, you know we we need you know much higher resolution, um, better data to do that work. Would have loved to incorporate LIDAR or other data sources, um, 
but that wasn't available uh, for these the watersheds. So our work is based upon um, uh, this photo interpretation. And one of the one of the really exciting pieces. Um, that this landscape evaluation process allows us to do and the use of these um, aerial photos is, is not to just look at the relative abundance of different uh, vegetation states or wildlife states, but to also look at the spatial patterns. I think this was the same slide that Paul showed earlier. Um, you know, but it, again, it's key. It's, it's not just how much of a particular stand structure or um, habitat or fuel loading that we have, but what is the spatial arrangement? How large are those patches? How are the patches configured compared to one another? You know, those have very real and important ecological um, implications for the functioning of these landscapes. Okay, so to show how all of this evaluation plays out and how do we put it down on the ground, I'm going to focus on one particular sub-watershed, uh, the North Fork Tainum. Oh. It's about 30,000 acres. Um, it's it's, it's uh, sort of middle to upper elevation, so dominated by moist mixed conifer. Uh, the dominant ownerships here are uh, U.S. Forest Service and TNC. The TNC lands are former Plum Creek Industrial Timberlands uh, that we acquired just over a year ago. And one of the reasons that we're focusing here you know, is that this this North Fork Tainum subwatershed is just, you know, it's ground zero for many of our, you know, critical conservation topics. Um, Northern spotted owls, steelhead, bull trout are all, you know, at play within the subwatershed. So don't worry about trying to pick out any of the detail of this map, but this is, you know, one of many of our evaluation maps that we've produced. This particular map is looking at uh, forest structure across the watershed. I simply bring it up to demonstrate that if you're looking at the sort of the right half of the map, um, that is the Forest Service ownership. You see, you see one condition, um, or you see very common conditions dominated by what we are calling young forest multi-story. Um, that is closed canopy, um, fairly dense forest structure ranging up to upwards of perhaps 80, 90 years old. Um, some large trees are present within, and they contrast greatly with the conditions that we see in the upper left corner, um, all of that maroon color. Those are the what are now TNC lands, former Plum Creek. Um, they were managed for uh, you know industrial purposes, and so we have a many uh, early cereal stand initiation stages, uh, lands that have been you know frankly worked worked fairly heavily over the you know many decades. And so when we, when, we, when we conduct our evaluation and we put together our landscape diagnosis, you know, a couple of big ticket items really jump out at us looking at this sub-watershed. And the first of which is related to those spatial patterns, and it's that we see the effects of fragmentation across this watershed. For many of our vegetation metrics, we see that the um, edge densities are too high, the patch sizes are too small, the distances between neighboring patches of similar types are too short um, compared to both our historic and our future uh, reference conditions. We see that we have an excess of Douglas fir cover types across the subwatershed compared to both historic and future. Now we have an excess of the stand initiation structural stage primarily on TNC lands. And then we have an excess of the young forest multi-story structural stage that's primarily on the uh, Forest Service lands. So next, looking at wildlife habitat more specifically, this map is showing uh, northern spotted owl habitat. Um, light, the light blue color is current spotted owl habitat. The dark blue is not current habitat. And interestingly, again, we see the effects of fragmentation within the subwatershed um, edge densities, patch size, edge densities are too high, patch sizes are too small, nearest neighbor distances are too close. Um, but then also interesting when we look at the amount of spotted owl habitat within this sub-watershed, uh, we are within the historic range of variation um, for this watershed for these biophysical settings. 
but the current amount of habitat is actually in excess of the future range of variation reference conditions. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that restoration means reducing the amount of owl habitat, but it does call into concern our ability to sustain this level of habitat within a future warmer and drier climate. Trying to advance here. And then finally, an example of one of our disturbance hazard maps. This map is showing uh, crown fire potential, ranging from high crown fire potential in red down to low in the, the lighter color. And what we see across the subwatershed is that the high crown fire hazard is far in excess of the FRV reference conditions. Uh, similarly, uh, ha a high hazards for uh, factors such as Western first budworm. Um, they're not outside of the reference conditions, but they're also very high. So, we, so we, the next stage then is to take all of those different diagnoses and boil it out and together into a, a landscape prescription. Again, what are the big ticket items that we can address uh, within this landscape? You know, and first and foremost, one of, you know, our objectives here are to reconnect the vegetation and the habitat based on soils and topography, pulling right from the seven principles. Um, we want to reduce Douglas fir cover and favor species such as ponderosa pine and western larch, species that will be more uh, resilient within a future climate, experiencing more fire. We want to decrease some of these um, disturbance hazards. And there's a need to set up the landscape for some long-term shifts in habitat. Um, we see that much of the older forest structure um, habitats have been eliminated from the upper end of the watershed from what the former Plum Creek lands. Um, some of the owl habitat is, is currently existing on very dry locations with high fire hazard. So there, over the long term, we may be wanting to set this watershed up to to slowly rearrange where we have and where we can sustain complex closed canopy forest habitats. Um, boiling this all down, we see in, you know, there's, there's perhaps need for 2,000 or so acres of thinning, of pre-commercial thinning stand initiation that primarily falls on TNC lands, and perhaps 4,000 acres or so of, of thinning on in the young forest multi-story structural stage converting to open canopy conditions and that primarily falls on the Forest Service lands. And all of that work, again, I want to acknowledge that it's, you know, it's critically important that that thinning is not just conducted on any acre of Young Forest multi-story, but that that is driven by our goals of you know, reconnecting vegetation and habitat based on the soils and topography of this landscape. So how does that play out? Um, the final piece to the analysis, which has been hugely useful, um, I want to call uh, Derek Churchill for helping us with this work, but has been to evaluate uh, and calculate a, a moisture deficit across this subwatershed. For those of you who aren't familiar, moisture deficit is it's 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 a way to evaluate you know the relative um, how you know how hot and dry, how water limited are different locations within the landscape. And what this helps us to do is identify you know within the stand, within the areas currently occupied by stand initiation, which are those relatively warmer and drier locations, um, which may be a target for stand initiation, which are the locations um, of young forest multi-story, again, that are within relatively warmer and drier locations where we would focus um, our thinning efforts. You know, and where are those areas where we, we might want to try to protect and connect complex forest habitat, um, thinning around these areas and trying to prevent or, or inhibit fire movement from coming into these um, uh, colder and wetter locations. And then finally, once you've identified the locations where um, we, we may be taking these thinning actions, you know, it comes down to the idea of um, how do we Landscapes within landscapes. How do we work within tree neighborhoods? How do we design our, our silvicultural prescriptions? And that's that's really where our collaborative is at right now, and we're uh, relying heavily again upon the work of Derek Churchill, Andrew Larson, and others 
uh, using their ICO or individuals, clumps, and openings approach to um, quantifying and restoring uh, within patch spatial patterns, um, obviously protecting and promoting uh, large and old trees, especially um, early cereal species such as pine and larch and, lar and dug fir um, where appropriate. And so we're just we're in the middle of this work right now. This is uh, members from the Tapash Collaborative uh, out in uh, Manassas Chain of last fall, uh, digesting and talking about the outcomes of these landscape prescriptions. And so I hope you see through this example how we've put these seven, you know, core principles to work. You know how we're working at multiple scales from using landscape evaluations to link, um, you know, region-wide conservation restoration priorities to individual sub-watersheds down to individual patches and treatment areas. How to topography is really guiding how these prescriptions and treatments applied on the ground. Our explicit focus on disturbance processes and vegetation patterns um, and evaluating and restoring the distribution of patch sizes. Um, our focusing um, of, of the patterns, tree patterns within patches. Um, I didn't talk as much about it, but obviously trying to protect and promote large and old trees and snags and logs are critical. And finally, working across ownership and management boundaries you know, is at the very heart of this project. So um, I would say stay tuned. This is uh, very much an ongoing project. Um, but just speaking for myself, it has been an incredibly exciting opportunity to, to take these principles and these evaluation tools and, and you know and put them put them on to the ground in a specific location and and see and it's been exciting seeing how the Taposh partners have rallied around um, this evaluation process. And so with that I'm going to stop my rambling and would love to take uh, questions along with Paul on uh, either of our presentations here. Fantastic. Thanks, Ryan. And I hardly call that rambling. That was a really great presentation. And and like Ryan said, let's open it up for questions. Um, go ahead and type those into the Q&A box, uh, which appears in my lower right-hand screen. So um, somebody asked where, if this would be, um, if, let's just see just asking where they'd be able to find the recording um, of the webinar. And again, I'll post that likely tomorrow. It takes a while to um, uh, to download that recording, but likely tomorrow to the Northwest Fire Science Consortium website, which the address is given in the question and answer box, um, uh, and also to our YouTube channel. We have another question. Uh, thoughts on using active timber management as tool in developing successional patterns and patches, fire as well, of course, were feasible with the many monetary and social constraints. How do we avoid the one and done scenario cycling back in 50 to 80 years? I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing the question, Jerry. Um, Paul, if you expand your question and answer box, um, yeah. on mine it's showing in the lower right-hand corner. Yeah. Do you see that? Yeah. Um, it should... Oh. Okay, I see a question. How systematic has your examination of historical photos been? Um, interesting. No. Oh. I uh, I'm getting different different questions here. So, um <laughs> what size of clumps and gaps do you recommend? Yep, oh, I see is. that one. So, Paul, I think if you scroll up, you'll get oh, to yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so just it's a tiny window, at least on mine it's tiny. So, I've scrolled all the way up and um from Trevor he asked thoughts on using active timber management as a tool in developing successional patterns and patches. Fire as well, of course, were feasible with the many monetary and social constraints. 
how do we avoid the one and done scenario cycling back in 50 to 80 years? And he also said to similar scenario we are faced with currently. So, Trevor, I'll I'll jump in quickly. I definitely want to hear what Paul has to say about this. Trevor, I'll just say, so within the Vanessa Tanum project, we're certainly looking at how do we use both um, timber management and fire as tool. I I, I don't think you can separate the two. Um, Both are critical, as you mentioned, I think, in your question. You know, the the social side of, of using of active timber management, the providing jobs, um, products to local businesses, that's a that's a, an important part for us. Um, how do we avoid the site? You know, how, the scenario of cycling back in 50 to 80 years. That's a excellent question. It's difficult. Um, I think in an ideal world, I would love to see that after we, you know, take on projects such as these, then we have a very real conversation about how do we change our fire management within these landscapes so that those natural disturbance processes can you know, be returned to playing their natural and important role. I know that's a, that's a very difficult and multi-layered conversation, um, particularly when, you're, when we're working within areas that are close to local communities or close to important resources, homes, and so forth. Um, but I agree that it's critical that we find a way to avoid, you know, one and done waiting, waiting for 50 or 80 years before we think about these landscapes again. Um, but I certainly don't have all the answers. I'd love to hear what Paul has to say. Okay. Well, um, I think active timber management, uh, thinning often combined with burning is going to be really important. And it's especially going to be important where, you need a fairly high degree of spatial precision of outcomes uh, from management. If you're really trying to tailor it to specific conditions and either the fuel loads or the vegetation conditions in terms of uh, canopy fuel simply don't allow you to get high spatial precision with fire alone, then it's going to, that coupling of uh, using silvicultural and fire tools together is really going to suggest itself. It's also going to be important near human habitats and the interface and so forth. And I would also argue that um, silviculturists have an uncanny ability, actually, to determine whether, and, and fire managers have the ability to determine whether their service and canopy fuel conditions allow them to be able to use uh, fire only as a tool uh, to achieve those goals. And very often in the Pacific Northwest and in the Inland Pacific, we simply don't have the veg conditions where uh, we can use fire alone uh, because the surface and canopy fuels are are really quite significant. We actually have conditions where we need to pre-treat fuels sometimes before we can actually do the silviculture because uh, fuel loads are are uh, really quite high. Okay, thanks for that. We have another question. Unless, Ryan, did I hear that you maybe wanted to add a little more to that? No, no. Okay, you... okay. So what size of clumps and gaps do you recommend? So the um, ICO methods that are published right now are actually adapted to different geographic areas. And the work that uh, Derek Churchill and his colleagues have done is to actually go into various geographic areas and get reference stands that where they can reconstruct the variability in clumpiness and gappiness and uh, get some real data on clump size distributions and gap size distributions, which allow them then to locally tailor prescriptions according to what was experienced by the local fire regime. So there really, again, isn't one size that fits all, Uh, Methods have been published for actually collecting these data locally from reference stands and then using that um, with established marking guidelines. Uh, Derek and company have published uh, ways of applying your local reference condition information in stand level prescriptions to specific geography. So no one size fits all, get data for local geographic areas and then use the established ICO methods to apply it where that's appropriate. And I would just call it, add to that that I, I don't know if people are still seeing my screen, but um, you know Derek and Andrew and, and Co. They've done a really nice job in both their publications and in also the implementation guide. 
They also do a very nice job of putting on train. They put on trainings on this ICO method across the Northwest. Um, we're actually going to be holding one in the Central Cascades in early May, uh, jointly sponsored by the Northwest Fire Science Consortium. So thanks, Carrie. Um, so I would say if people are interested, you know, you know, take a read of these references. Try to hook up with one of the many training opportunities. Um, you know, if you're working on a forest, if you're in a region where there hasn't been a training, uh, the Arkin crew are are they're a great group to work with, and they uh, they always seem more than happy to to come down and, and work with people. Great. So I've just got a comment in privately to me, and, and that comment uh, says, quite a shift in thinking in that it implies we log the dry, rocky aspects without prompt reforestation, conflicts with reforestation standards, designation of commercial acreage, etc. Thank you. So that was a comment just um, posted to me privately. Um, and then I actually have some more uh, questions that have been posted to me privately. Um, let me just, I uh, have one here that says, great presentations. I have two questions, concerns. One is the logistics of thinning and impacts from ground-based systems and perhaps impacts to leave trees. Also, there is a group of people saying that trees can't be clumped since they will be stressed due to drought. What are you, where are you at on that one? So there's actually pretty good um, research data to suggest that uh, even spacing wasn't the norm in most of the mixed conifer forests that have been studied this far. That uh, patchy and gappy mortality and regeneration was quite a bit more typical and that's the research that motivates the ICO methods. Um, when, when folks go and look at the uh, stem maps of stands that have had regular fighter, what they find is this clumpy gappy appearance. And, um, and when they evaluate the cohorts that have developed in those same patches, they see patchy cohort development. So low severity fires producing sort of this continuous cohort regeneration in clumped and gapped arrangements. And so it's, uh, so it's actually two things were going on in that um, patches tended to be understocked. They weren't at carrying capacity. And for the carrying capacity that was occupied, it, it tended to be clumped or, or uh, with opening. Uh, and I would add to the, one of the previous questions, um, at least in the example that I was giving from that North Fork Cane and some watershed, where you were calling for thinning, they, those were not sort of your, you know, very hot, dry, rocky outcrops, um, but they were the relatively warmer and drier locations within that watershed. Um, I will say, however, at least thinking about Washington State forest practices, I think there we do have a conflict in places with reforestation um, guidelines and our ideas of what may be you know, sustainable and resilient within our you know, lower ecotones um, and our, our very driest forests. And so I think that is a conversation that we need to have. Um, I got a couple of questions from Chris Stockdale here. Um, first one is uh, how systematic uh, was your examination of the historical photos? Um, we, we actually went to the National Archives with a crew of eight people for several months. And uh, because our, uh, our procurement order was in the millions of dollars and uh, they couldn't staff it. So uh, we actually looked through every single film canister that they had of historical photography within the interior Columbia Basin. And, um, and we were able to detect the uh, areas that were sequentially logged, the earliest aerial photos typically represented an aerial reconnaissance of the next place where they wanted to go and do selection cutting. And so um, we were able to not only determine that our historical photos were quite representative, but we were actually able to look at the entire supply of historical photos and determine uh, the canisters that showed the earliest, most primitive view. Second question was, how variable through time do you think these processes are? That is, 
Um, these uh, historical images show a particular condition in the early 1900s, but what might the landscape have looked like in the 1800s or 1700s? It's a great question. We don't have uh, aerial photography from that time, but one of the things that we notice is that when we look at a fairly large sample of landscapes within an ecoregion, we don't see a small amount of variation. We actually see quite an extraordinarily large amount of variation. But if you think about the variation, it's not all over the map. It's influenced by dominant disturbance regimes, climatic influences, and environmental conditions. And so this concept of the historical range of variation really takes on uh, some fairly strong characteristics. You see that uh, landscapes aren't uh, of a single kind. They're of many kinds. There's sort of a cloud of conditions that resonates within these dominant influences. And so we feel that in terms of the landscapes that we inherited early in the 20th century, we probably have a reasonable sample of the variability uh, that occurred in work we did with the Rocky Mountain Research Station, Bob Keen's lab. We were able to show that the uh, historical variation that we were able to photo interpret that was very similar to what we could simulate with uh, state and transition succession and disturbance models. So we feel like we got a good sample of the variability. We have no idea whether it represents the variability of the 1800s or 1700s, um, but we are fairly confident that it represents the variability of the early 1900s. Yeah. So, so I've got a question from Ann Schliske here. Hi, Ann. Good to hear from you again. Um, so the question was, are there areas where the Toposh collaborative members do not have agreement about how to design prescriptions from the landscape analysis? Um, so a couple of facets to that. So, so first off, the, the various Toposh members certainly have um, slightly different objectives for their lands. For example, the Washington Department of Natural Resources you know, they have what you know trust land obligations for their lands, so it's a different objective than State Fish and Wildlife or TNC or Okanagan Wenatchee have. And so, some of the conversations we're having right now is how can the landowners use the overarching evaluations and prescriptions to contribute to the shared goals of Toposh Collaborative while also meeting their individual obligations. Um, I mean, one of the things I, I have to say was just really exciting. Last fall, we held a series of field trips for the Deposh members and Deposh executives to walk them through these landscape evaluations. And um, the level of both engagement and interest and buy-in to these evaluations was, was really quite high. <laughs> uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say I'm surprised, but I was, just, I was very excited about that. And so we're in the process right now of having the very um, kind of, you know, good detailed conversations about how do we use these prescriptions and how do we turn that into projects. I know both um, the Nature Conservancy and State Fish and Wildlife, you know, as soon as the snow is out, we're on the ground this spring starting to plan out some of our first treatment units. Um, and one of the nice things about this process is that it, it allows us to be somewhat disjunct in our planning process. Um, you know, state agencies, which can move more, you know, in private, which can move more quickly, we're able to start doing work now. Forest service planning, which is obviously a little bit slower, is able to move at its time frame, but still, you know, by us having the common foundation of these evaluations, prescriptions, um, you know, we're able to have complementary and coordinated treatments, even if we, we can't do the, you know, environmental planning at the exact same time. Okay, great. So there, there are actually a lot of questions that have come in, so I'm just going to grab what I think is next in queue. Um, great presentation. My question is that based on decades observation, is it possible to give a general ranking of resilience of different forest species to fire in PNW? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, probably the best way to, uh, to answer that might be to bound 
confound the question by the nature of the resilience that you might be concerned. There's a lot of kinds of resilience for sure. And uh, so it's difficult considering those kinds of resilience to to give a, uh, a super defined bounded answer. From what we can see in our um, deficit evaluations of current landscapes, it looks to us like uh, a lot of the early cereal species in the pine and mixed conifer forests uh, still will occupy these landscapes given the, the changes in the fire regimes and the climatic regimes that are forecasted. Species like uh, ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, western larch still appear to have a very definite edge. Um, although we're noting that the carrying capacities are probably going to be uh, significantly lower, especially in the lower montane environments and near ecotones. Um, it seems like the species that we're noting that have the least resilience are the, uh, the uh, true firs, grand fir, subalpin fir, uh, white fir in particular. Um, we're seeing that a number of bark, primary bark beetles are uh, attacking uh, these species more frequently, so they're less resilient to bark beetle attack, and uh, we're seeing large outbreaks also occurring with some secondary bark beetles, or beetles that 30 years ago we thought were secondary bark beetles. So um, I'll probably, I'll stop right there and see if there's a, another facet of that question that the, the questioner is interested in. Gary, do you, uh, do you, do you remember who the who asked the question? Yeah, it was. Let me see here. This is a good thing that I'm having to scroll through so many. That means there's a, a lot of questions here. So, Yu Yang Zheng. And um, so while we wait, if if uh, Are there Yang, other yeah, yeah, actually, let's move on to another question, and then, and if uh, they want to respond, they certainly can. Uh, we've got a question from Jim Erickson. What will our nation's fire suppression policy be to accommodate these FRV? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to touch that. I have, I don't, I don't set policy, and um, I don't have that crystal ball. I, I, I'll, I'll take the same stance. Um, other than I, I think using ideas such like FRV. You know, we've been talking about HRV for for quite some time. Um, as climate change, ideas like FRV need to become part of our conversation, just like HRV has been part of our conversation. I think that's a good answer. <laughs> um, so moving on, I think this is similar to the previous question from James Barker. We have, do concerns over increasing tree mortality trends factor into restoration goals? Will future climate support trees where you want them? I'll start with the, I'll start with the last one. Um, in some places, future climate will not support trees. And there are two aspects of that that are important. Um, the landscape of uh, physiognomic types, grassland, shrubland, woodland, and forest, used to be quite different. We concentrate often on, you know, uh, spatial patterns of forest cover types and structural conditions, but the map of life forms of physiognomic conditions has changed really significantly. So actually, there was a lot more area in forest potential vegetation types that was in uh, grassland, shrubland, and woodland, not in forest cover historically. It was quite a significant area, especially in the dry forests. So uh, restoration actually suggests that moving more in that direction is probably a pretty big idea. With the climate change and our evaluation of the FRV conditions, we're seeing that uh, there's going to be an increase, uh, a further increase in grasslands and shrublands 
um, especially in the lower montane environments, and there's going to be changes in uh, some of the ridgetop environments as well um, as a consequence of uh, shifts in the climate. So we expect that um, uh, between the mid and the late uh, 21st century that we're going to have uh, fairly significant shifts going on and our goal is to create landscapes that actually have the ability to adapt uh, rather than to abruptly accomplish those shifts. And stated another way, for example, in eastern Washington with the Okanagan and Wenatchee, our use of HRV and FRV data is a bet hedging strategy. What we try to do is create conditions that actually in data space lie in the overlapping area between the FRV and the HRV conditions. So as uncertainties um, are removed and we get a clear vision of what climate's going to do, we have the ability to move in several different directions from whatever is the existing condition at that time. Rand, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think I, I think you covered that well. Great. Then just one uh, last question before we close. It is 11:15, um, and to be respectful to our presenters and your time, I want to close out um, at that time. Uh, there is uh, from Trevor Miller. Is there a place to view a compiled set of the John Marshall photos? Um, there isn't yet, but we're planning on putting them together. We're still. We're still doing work to accumulate them, um, and uh, we hope to continue the photo photography for the for the next few years um, because those uh, those old negatives are are uh, getting old, falling apart, and so we've got an active effort to to continue to scan those, get those available, and then rephotograph them. I don't know uh, when we'll actually. Um, get them online in a particular site um, because this is actually just a bootleg project that we have going on right now. We're just interested in capturing so much of the information and not letting it go to waste. So stay tuned, Trevor. Um, if you're interested in where we have photos or maybe even using some, I'm happy to share what I have so far. Great. So that's a wrap for today. I'm hoping that we've answered everybody's questions. If not, the presenters have given um, their email addresses to you. And I just want to say thanks again to Paul and Ryan for talking with us today. You can have another opportunity to catch both of them at the Central Oregon Fire Science Symposium, which is held this year in Bend on March 24th and 25th. That's correct, right, Paul and Ryan? You'll both be there? Yes. Yep, Great. that's correct. Awesome. I also want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to listen in today. The Northwest Fire Science Consortium tries to offer a diversity of these opportunities for people to participate in, and hosting this webinar is just one way we can accomplish that. So if you have any interesting ideas for a webinar, please don't hesitate to get a hold of us here at the consortium. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, for joining in, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Thanks Gary. Thanks so much. Yep. All right.